Hello, welcome back to Tail 3 Cabins. If you've been on this earth for any length of time, you realize that there are certain days when things just spiral out of control and nothing seems to be going right. And then there's times where things just all fall into place and seem to work out pretty decent. And this is kind of one of those times. I've been uh, building this pole barn for a while, as you know, if you're watching the channel, I've gone through the many steps of getting to this point. And in the back of my mind, and even before building this pole barn, I had kind of like dabbled with how I would power my shed, um, how I would put power in this pole barn if I ever had one, and now I do have one. What are my power requirements, and what are my options? So if you've watched uh, a while back, I did put power to my shed, which is about um, 40 feet that away. And I just ran a 12 gauge wire underground, underground Romex and just hooked it up to one of my breakers and I have it on a ground fault and that is enough for what I need in my shed. Charging up my tractor at the time, charging up the lawnmower, etc. Maybe put a light or two in there and that was good. Now I have this pole barn and I got a whole new dilemma. What do I want to do for power again? I don't know the fate of that shed that I have there that has the power in it. I've got some issues with the township that they want me to tear it down. The zoning board wants me to tear it down and we're in court right now. Stay tuned to see what happens with that. If you want to go back and see some of the reasons why they want me to tear it down, check out um, a few of my earlier videos. So the three main options that I see is that that shed is going to stay. I could probably tap into that underground Romex that I put over there and run another 50 feet over here. It is kind of lengthy when you think about going all the way back to the house that's probably about 170 feet of 12 gauge Romex so I definitely would not want to hook anything up that's got a high amperage high wattage but for lights and a, a few other items it might be just fine another thing I thought of if I ever had to put like uh, if I wanted to turn this into a workshop and I had table saws or things that might need 220 I'd have to run a whole new line and that would be trenching all the way back to the house and I would probably have to buy some four or six gauge wires, something really heavy duty. I'd have to put another sub panel onto my panel or actually put a whole new meter in off of our transformer off the side of our driveway. And that would just kind of be a mess, something I don't even want to think about. Right now, this pole barn is storage for me. And uh, just I'll come in here and if I got to do some repairs on the tractor, I have the room and uh, just Overall, I'll be in here. I need a little bit of electricity, but not much. Right now, I probably just want something for a trickle charger. I want to handle these lights up here. I think the worst case scenario for me wattage-wise would be a compressor right now. So then the other option was solar. I've always kicked around solar in the back of my mind. I've always, you know, kind of dreamed of having solar panels on the house. And I did have a company come out one time and did a little survey and it just wasn't going to work. We have too many trees around our backyard and there just wasn't enough sun hours to, to really make it practical at all. But I'm a little bit further north here and I get a little bit more sun on this pole barn and I get a little bit more sun on the shed. So I always thought, well, I could maybe dabble and put some solar out here and just kind of get my feet wet. Now comes where things kind of fall together. A company called Blue Eddy um, sent me an email from their marketing department, saw one of my videos actually on the pole barn and asked if I would want to try one of their devices. And it's funny because I had been watching Blue Eddy for a while now. So imagine my surprise when I got a call from the marketing for the company Blue Eddy. And at first I thought the email was a phishing scam or maybe just like a, some sort of hoax. But it turns out it was the marketing team of Blue Eddy. And uh, they saw one of my videos on building the pole barn and maybe how I might power, power it. And they asked me if I wanted to do a review on one of their products. And it's funny because I was leaning towards this as one of the solutions for my pole barn. Some people call these solar generators. Some others call them portable power stations. And it's basically a uh, large rechargeable battery that's capable of running regular outlets, 110 outlets, uh, USB outlets. And there you have it. This comes with a DC power 
for charging from your vehicle, AC power for charging off of your 110 outlets, and then it comes with the solar connections for your solar panels. And I'm probably going to be most interested in this part. All right, to quickly go over the outputs on this device, there are 13 charging outputs all together. You have two two-prong outlets, regular 110s. You have two three-prong outlets, 110. You've got four USB ports. You've got a USB-C port, 100 watts. This would be great for charging a laptop or working with your laptop off of this device. Then you have some DC ports up here, two of those, and then your regular cigarette lighter type port right here. These are all separated by quadrants, so if you're just using 110 outlets, you can turn on the inverter and plug something in and just go off of that. If you also need to charge something else by USB, you can turn that quadrant on. So the information you're going to see on the display is your watts coming in on the top. So if you're plugged into uh, the AC charger, you're going to see about 200 watts coming in. If you're plugged into solar panels, depending on your sunlight and panels, you could have up to 200 watts coming in. And then on the bottom is the watts that are going out. So whatever you plug in here, you're going to see this number go up. For instance, if you plug in a 60 watt light bulb, that's actually 60 watts and not an LED light bulb, that you're going to see 60 watts show up there on the display. Now I mentioned that there are 13 ways to charge off of this, and if you start counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, where is the last one? Well, on top, you can charge your phone. So I got my phone on top here and it's charging and it's putting out about 3 to 4 watts. Another thing this portable power station has is a basically a little space light here to light up an area. This is low, high, and then SOS if you're so inclined. You really can't get a good idea of just how bright the light is right now because I got my lights on in the garage here. But at night it's going to light up a good area and this would be very handy when you're out in the woods. If you got this thing on your UTV or you're at a campsite. Now it has a recessed handle on the top which is nice because it keeps it flat. Some of the other portable power stations out there might have a handle going across the top. You pick it up like this and it might be hard to for storage or, or stacking other things when you're trying to combine everything into your trunk or on your UTV. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the solar aspect is probably what has me the most interested about this because I've always wanted to dabble around with solar, get my feet wet a little bit, but to take that plunge, to get started, a lot of times you'd have to get, of course, solar panels. Once you get your solar panels, you're going to need a charge controller. Charge controller will regulate the power coming from the solar panels into what you're charging, say a battery source. If you want to use that solar power to store, you're going to need batteries. And then if you want to get energy out of those batteries, say in a 110 device, you're going to need an inverter to convert the battery to AC, from DC to AC. So to get your feet wet, you've got to buy some pretty expensive materials to start using solar. Now this has your charge controller built in, it's got your batteries built in, and it's got the inverter built in. So all you need to do is plug in a solar panel to it and you're good to go. And it's pretty simple. If you've never dabbled with solar and I picked up a solar panel just because I wanted to test this out on Amazon, you're going to take your connectors and it comes with the adapter that you need. And it's pretty much a no-brainer. You're going to plug into positive, a negative. You're going to put your panel out in the sun and it's not going to work in here we're indoors and then you're going to plug it in and you're going to start seeing wattages go up depending on how powerful the sun is out there so i thought that's pretty cool this is a 100 watt panel the maximum that this unit can do is 200 watts so i did buy a second panel i'm going to get into some real world testing here in a little bit to go outdoors and just show you how this all works now even though I get more sun out of the shed area compared to the backyard, it's still not till about 11 o'clock where I start to see full sun on the shed roof. 
to maximize charging, I purchased two 100 watt panels and some cabling so I can keep them onto my shed. And then I want to put them in parallel, so I brought the connector so I can put these in parallel and not series. If I put it in series, the voltage is going to go over the maximum voltage. I'll leave links below for everything that I purchased here. Now I'm not going to mount these officially on the shed just yet because I don't know the fate of my shed. But I'm going to kind of wedge them up here. Put them at a decent angle that's optimal for this time of year. It's late September. When I get the sun coming over here, it's 11 o'clock, and then I start losing it around 3 o'clock. I had also purchased a 40-foot extension cable for solar wiring, which is 10 gauges thick, and I thought that would be enough to get me into the shed, and it was pretty tight, actually. I just had a little bit coming out of the conduit that I put in before the concrete was poured. As I mentioned earlier, the two panels are rated at 100 watts each, and probably the best I'm ever going to see come out of them would be around 150 watts coming into this device. One nice thing is that you can charge this at the same time that you're using the power. So I have my shop lights on in the pole barn, and I'm getting solar power coming into it at the same time. At the bottom is the wattage of my LED lights in the pole barn, and on top are the wattage of the incoming power from the solar panels. So right now this thing is powering the lights that I have in here. I could probably put a couple more LEDs up there and it's not going to create too much of a difference. If I weren't taking any power in from the solar panels and just running these lights off of the blue eddy, I would probably just be getting about three hours of use of light out of a full charge. And then maybe when I'd wake up in the morning and the sun would come out, this thing would start charging again and I'd have a fresh battery by the time it got dark again. Another place I'm looking forward to using this is in Southern Ohio. I brought it down here, at, we were down doing some maintenance down here, and this is going to come in handy, especially when we're up here doing some work. A lot of times we might be putting up tree stands, or uh, maybe we're even going to assemble a tree stand. We've been talking about making blinds, so we'll be cutting a lot of wood. We'll probably be using uh, a circular saw. And we were just using this to put up a tree stand, but now and then if your batteries go dead, you don't bring enough batteries with you, well, you can bring the charger with you and swap them out as you go. And you can charge batteries multiple times on this thing. I even brought the solar panel with me just to kind of show you that it's at a terrible angle right now. It's actually pulling in four watts just being on this angle and it is a cloudy overcast day. So I can put this thing on the roof or in the bed here and charge this thing while we're still charging other batteries and just kind of maintaining the power in here, especially if it's going to be a nice sunny day out. I only brought one panel with me. I think that's probably enough to take care of things if we were out here working for an afternoon. If I plug in my light, let's say we're working towards later in the evening, I got a battery charge in here in the charger. I can be charging my phone on top and I got a couple more outlets to spare. A couple times uh, when your UTV starts getting a little long in the tooth and maybe you're going out for that first time, your battery sounds kind of low or close to dead when you first start it. And if you take it up here on the hill, chances are it might not start again when you come back to it. So I could put this on the trickle charger and charge it while I'm hunting. If I have the solar panel, it's probably going to be a wash when it comes to the amount of power being used. It's portable enough to take it with me. It was nothing to throw it in the back of the UTV. When we came down here last year, the power was out. Somebody hit a, a pole down the road a little ways and it was out for a good long time and it took us by surprise. I wasn't prepared for it. We don't have a generator down here or anything and we kind of sat in the dark. I was actually lighting decorative oil lamps that we have hanging on the wall to get a little bit of light in the cabin and it was kind of cold. We had heat through our propane furnace but uh, it would have been nice. I could have plugged in a TV set. I could have plugged in our phone chargers. I could have plugged in our cell phone booster and at least let people know that we didn't have power. And if you have a hunting blind, this would be kind of neat to put in there because you could get some lower wattage coffee makers, make yourself fresh coffee while you're hunting. You could be charging your phone. Um, if we had a cell phone booster on top of the hill here, or sometimes they make small miniature ones, you could get a cell phone booster plugged into this thing. Just a multitude of items up to 700 watts. All right, let's go back to Northern Ohio. Okay, it's a little dark in here because I have everything off, but to do some real world testing, I'm gonna start off by bringing some light back in here with the shop lights. 
Okay, I got shop lights on and I got a LED accent light like a work light on in front of me to kind of give a little more light up front here. I'm going to turn on a fan. I am going to start charging my drone battery. I'm going to turn on the DC outlet which has my tractor lights in the background. I don't know if you can see them or not. Let me raise up the camera a little bit. I still want to keep everything else within the shot here. And then I'm going to bring up all the USB ports and USB charging. So I'm charging my iPad. I'm charging the controller for my drone. I'm charging my Apple Watch. And I'm charging a Shark Boom speaker. Charging my laptop off of the USB C cable. And I have pretty much every port used up except these two little DC ports. And if I want to finish it off, I can throw my phone on top and start charging that. So right now I am at 295 watts out of 700. So you can do all these things off of this battery. Of course, the more you're going to do, the, the quicker the battery is going to run down. But that's pretty amazing. You're not going to hook everything into this constantly like this. So it just gives you an idea of just how many things you could function with if you're at a campsite, if you're in a, a garage or a shed that's you know away from the house that doesn't have power. So these are all running right now. I could probably add a few more things. So what happens if you overload this thing? Right now I'm using the shop lights and an accent light while I'm videoing this. And I'm going to turn on this power stripper or heat gun. And I tripped. And I get a little information on there that says that there was a fault. Now I have spent a lot of time going over the solar aspect of charging this device, but you don't need solar panels to to charge it. The quickest and probably easiest way would be of course plugging into a 110 outlet and using the included charger. The included charger is probably going to give you the quickest charge rate. It's going to give you about 200 watts. Right there is 194 coming in, 208. And this will charge this from empty in about two to three hours. If you want to double that time, if you do have the solar panels, you could also plug into solar panels and it's going to bump up the wattage coming in and it's going to charge it all the more quicker. So it might cut that time in half depending if you got a full 200 watts coming in from solar or not. So right and then your slowest method of charging is probably going to be if you go off your vehicle charger on your accessory plug in your car. This would be, you know, if you're going on a long trip, maybe you could plug this in while you're driving, charge it up, or if you have some other source that uses this accessory cable, this is another method of charging. One thing that led me in the direction of this type of unit is the battery inside. It's a lithium iron phosphate battery. So these are safer and they're longer lasting. For example, if you have a typical iPhone or Android phone, they're easily good for about seven to eight hundred charging cycles. So after about two years, you notice that your phone doesn't hold a charge like it used to. Where this is capable of 2,500 cycles before it starts to show any degradation. Usually it's about the 80% mark after 2,500 cycles. With the phone, it's about 7,800 cycles to the 80% mark. So that means that I could discharge and recharge this every day for six years and 10 months, just shy of seven years, and it would still have 80% of its capacity. So that gives me a little bit of peace of mind to have something of this caliper and not having to worry about it going bad so quickly. So just a few comments. Of course, 700 watts has its limitations, but you can go bigger. I would probably like it a little bigger in here, but I'm going to give this a try for a little while. I was using it for the last couple days, and I just keep the solar panels connected to it. And as the battery gets used, they kick in. When the sunlight's out, they kick in more. Today's a little bit overcast, so there's just a, a few uh, watts coming in. Um, and I'm powering the little accent light here so you can see a little bit better. Another thing I would like is if this display stayed on all the time or you had the option to leave it on. I know it shuts off probably to conserve power. And one other thing is when you do have the display on, it might be nice to see under the current load how much time you have left for this battery before it's going to die. 
or um, when it's charging, how much time is it going to take under the current load that is charging by to charge this back up. But it does have the levels of the battery right here. And I would think after you're using it a while for some of the same things over and over again, you'd kind of get a feel for how long something's going to last by what you have left on the level here. Other than that, it's a pretty neat little device. It's been getting its uses. I've been putting this pole barn together and kind of organizing it. I've been uh, charging different batteries with the drill and my phone and just kind of going back and forth. Sometimes I use the light. I'm using an accent light right now so you can see a little bit better. It's really an interesting device and it gives you a lot of capabilities. So that's going to do it for today. I appreciate everybody watching. Hope you enjoy and subscribe to these videos and keep an eye on us. Take care everybody.